join today's episode of the Rice Crypto Show, I am joined by returning guest Reggie Middleton. He is the inventor of peer-to-peer capital markets and self-sovereign finance, as well as the founder of DeFi. I will include links in the video description for his previous appearances, and I definitely encourage you to check those ones out. Before we get into it, make sure you visit RiceTVX.com and sign up for my mailing list so you never miss an update or new Rice TVX and Rice Against the Grain content. You will also find links to all of my various channels as well as my social media. Make sure you're following both of my YouTube channels, Rice TVX as well as Rice Against the Grain. And due to censorship, make sure you follow me on other alternative platforms such as Rumble and Odyssey where I do post up exclusive content. If you want to support Rice TVX, be sure to check out and join my Patreon channel where you will get early access to my videos with no ads unedited. You will also get exclusive content and more. I will include links in the video description for everything I just mentioned as well as everything shared on today's video. All right, I am joined by returning guest, Reggie Middleton. He is the disruptor in chief. He is the founder of DeFi. He has predicted many booms and busts. He is the inventor of peer-to-peer capital markets and self-sovereign finance. He has been on the show before, and I will include links down below in the video description so you can check out those previous appearances. Reggie, welcome back. How's it going, my friend? It's going well. It's going well. You know, things are happening. I'm a little sleep well, deprived, but you know, my I thoughts. really I do appreciate you taking time to do the the interview. I know you got a lot going on. You're a busy man. Uh, I just wanted to kind of get some catch catch up action on what's been happening with you in regards to the DeFi patent that you have. Um the, the last time that I had you on, and it feels like it hasn't been this long, but I have seen you in between in person in Miami, uh January 10th. 2022 was the last time I interviewed you. Um, not too long after that, you had been awarded the patent in the United States that basically covers what we know of as decentralized finance. Previous to that, you had gotten the patent in Japan. I will include links for the patents as well. This is the U.S. patent, devices, systems, and methods for facilitating low trust and zero trust value transfers. And it's basically an umbrella that covers everything DeFi. And we'll kind of get a little bit more into that. But if you want the gist of it, make sure you check out the previous interview. Um, currently, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to get Reggie on, was there is a lawsuit going on now. Uh, and I'm surprised that finally crypto media is finally covering something in regards to this because there was, there was really nothing written uh, in regards to the patents that you have been awarded in Japan and the United States. But now Coindesk and Cointelegraph are covering the fact that, I don't know if it's you specifically or or if it's Veritasium Incorporated or what the lawsuit consists of, but Coinbase is being sued for alleged, is what they're saying, pat- patent infringement. Uh, and that would be in regards to your patent. So you want to kind of tell me tell me a little bit and share what's going on with this particular case? Well, I'm pretty sure they're reporting it because they didn't have a choice. Reuters broke it early, then Bloomberg Law, um, and then all the big business media and major media. And uh, they would be remiss if they didn't. Um, not everybody reported it accurately. A lot of them had to throw in that SEC nonsense. They and to, um, yeah. they also misreported what the lawsuit was about. If you read the lawsuit, you know, it's not so much about Coinbase, but, you know, we could discuss that in a different interview. Um, I have to give props to Cointelegraph, though. They did a fairly balanced reporting, and I'm not used to that. It's not from crypto media. So um, kudos to uh, did I say Coinbase, to Coin. Telegraph. I think you said Coin Telegraph. I got the yeah. Coin Telegraph article pulled up, and I've got a few friends over at Coin Telegraph that I've been since January, been telling them about this. So maybe 
some of the the research and what they they found there they didn't there was no way they could really report on this bad if people did the proper research in regards to all the things that you've been involved with including the sec stuff and we're seeing a lot of corruption with the sec even today with the ftx sam bankman freed crap so yeah. that's another conversation for another day as well yeah see well um i'm under what is effectively a gag order with the sec settlement but I don't have to say much now because as a few years have went by, actual facts speak for themselves. Um, so, you know, recent history has vindicated my name. Right? But to move on from there, because I'm very disappointed in that part of the U.S. government, extremely. Um, one of Aren't the, we the all? Tastes, <laughs> one of the very tasty entities to Coinbase uh, because it felt that Coinbase was uncooperative in negotiations. Um, Coinbase, you know, reacted accordingly. They hired, you know, the big mega law firm, 1,200, 1,600 attorneys, et cetera, with another firm to file in Delaware. There's two firms, maybe 1,600 between the two of them, employ um, attorneys, two or 3,000 employees, you know, the big white shoe effect. Um, they asked for an extension to reply, which um, I was reticent to agree to um, personally, but corporate affairs are a different matter because they were first notified or noticed in July. Um, and they had July till the actual suit. And then they had 21 days after the actual suit to reply. That's a lot of time. And they have their own internal IP staff. So um, we gave them an extension, not as much as they asked for. They went to the court. They got a 30 day extension. And they wanted that extension. Um, we knew they wanted it because they were going to try and file for a motion to dismiss, to try and dismiss the case, which they did, saying a bunch of things, basically attacking the patent, attacking the patent office, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, we responded with an opposition to that motion a couple of days ago. Um, if you read it, the opposition reads very well. You read the complaint. Um, which has 117 pages of just claim charts, which means it's not the actual legal portion, just the evidence that we found without going to discovery took 117 pages. This okay. right here that I got pulled up is from thomasruders.com. It's legal docs and it only consists of 17 pages. Is this something that's worth me sh sharing or is there something more detailed? What does it say? What's the title say? Um, that's the second bolded line right above the paragraph right above the paragraph it says comes now plaintiff veritasium capital llc by and through its counsel carl brundridge and david moore of Bund right. bundage and stanger pc right so that's our lawsuit without the claims trial without the evidence without okay. the evidence without the evidence the evidence are additional 117 pages if you don't mind, I'll get you to send me a link to that on Telegram so I can include that in the video description. Because I was trying to look up information on the case, and this is the only thing that I had found. Yeah, you have to go through Pacer and pay for it, but I'm pretty sure I have a copy somewhere. Just okay, just remind okay. me. No. Well, I mean, aside from the evidence, uh, it should pretty much explain most everything. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on was to kind of clarify what it was specifically. Because, you know, like if we go back, if people watch that second interview that me and you did, one of the things that I really wanted to stress from it is that this is not an attack on cryptocurrency and Reggie's not trying to bring it into crypto. He's not trying to end DeFi as we know it. He applied for patents back in 2013, was awarded in Japan and the United States and just wants to be able to protect his IP. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Let's go over nomenclature and semantics and words and just the way, you know, what words mean, you know, if you make something, you have a you you have a job. Let's suppose you work at McDonald's. Okay, you work uh, a full work week. Okay, you get paid weekly. Uh, come Friday afternoon, you want your paycheck. Okay, if you go to McDonald's corporate and you ask for your paycheck, you're not attacking McDonald's. You're not trying to bring an end to fast food around the world. You're not attacking the restaurant industry. You want to get paid for the work that you did. Okay, if you have an apartment, a house that you pay for, and you live in that house, and someone comes in and moves into the your bedroom, puts their big ashy feet up on your you know your coffee table, 
and then rents out your bed and all the other beds, kicks your daughter out of the room and makes money off of your house. You either want them to pay for their occupancy or you want to throw them out. You're not attacking humankind. You know, you're not trying to bring down the, you know, bring the downfall of real estate, residential real estate around the country. So, you know, this attacking and bringing things down is pure nonsense. Intellectual property is akin to personal property under U.S. law. You invent something, it's yours if you're patented and it's, the patent is granted. And you can give it away for free if you want. You can refuse to give it to anybody or you can sell it or license right. it. It's yours. Um, the industries that have the thickest patent um, collections and the most protected IP just so happen to be the biggest and fastest growing industries in this country. You know, examples, the smartphone industry, the iPhone has about 1,200 patents. The Samsung Fold phones have about 1,400. Samsung is the largest phone uh, manufacturer in the world. And Apple is either second or third. Okay. And if it's third, then the second also has um, significant patents in their portfolio and on their phones. So that goes to show you that patents don't um, destroy the phone industry. Right. Use any industry, biopharmaceutical, biomedical, pharmaceutical, um, everything that has patents has significant growth. The reason is it incentivizes companies and people and entities to invest. And after they invest, they can actually make money with it. So this cypherpunk crypto open source mentality that if you own something, you bring down the industry is anti-capitalistic, anti unconstitutional, anti-capitalistic. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't fit well in the U.S. That's more of a socialist, you know, maybe Northern European thing. Go ahead. Okay, so, I mean, what you said is 100% correct. And we went into this in the, that second interview, too. Like, we went into this whole open source cyberpunk mentality ethos. And if the thing is, regardless of if somebody creates a technology and doesn't want to patent it, you can have financial, especially when it comes to fintech, you can have... In, in any instance, you can have other entities that did not create these technologies come in and patent it right underneath of you, and you lose rights to your creation. Is that correct? It's possible, but it's not that simple. If you created something and you published it um, or somehow um, created prior art, then someone can't come and patent it. Okay, They can only patent something if you created it and kept it to yourself. Okay. Now, if you are not concerned about um, intellectual property rights, then you don't care if someone pans it or not. If you do care, then you care about intellectual property rights. And if you care about it, then patent it. Well, and we I mentioned too that we've seen Bank of America, they've filed hundreds of patents. I don't know how many of which have been awarded to them, but let's say, for example, and I'm sure it, it possibly took place that Bank of America was trying to put through a patent on DeFi in some capacity. And since you were able to file, since you filed it before <clears> them, <throat> they didn't have any right to it. So the thing is whether or not you're, you're a cypherpunk and you believe in the open source ethos, which I, I completely love <clears throat> and, and respect by when it comes to what other entities can do with the IP rights and then exclude the people who created it. Uh, when it comes to code and things like that, I think it it would be hard to prove um, who created something first. I mean, we've seen so many arguments throughout history about who created electricity, the telephone, whether or not the actual people who were granted the IP rights were, in fact, the legit inventors. But to get back to the Coinbase situation, what, what specifically is the case concerning? Um, almost everything, almost the entire revenue base, I'd say about a little over 90% of their revenue base is covered by the um, the patented invention. Um, that's my personal opinion. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an engineer. I'm not even smart. I'm just a dad. But, you know, dad's you're not dad smart. Daddy. You're Reggie Middleton daddy. saying you're not smart. That's really funny. You're you're a comedian is what you are. <laughs> I am funny, too. But <laughs> not everybody thinks so, but I do. So, um their use of Ethereum, um, proof of stake, their use of Ethereum, proof of work, uh, their use of uh, Bitcoin transfers, of cold storage, of NFT transfer, um, in certain jurisdictions, even NFT um, minting. Uh, 
it's a pretty long better use of asset backed tokens, stable coins, um, cold storage, if I haven't mentioned that. So it's a pretty long list. Um, we haven't gotten to the discovery phase yet. Um, if and when we do, that list gets to be uh, crystallized and solidified and will invariably be significantly expanded. Um, what we put in was just what was easily available um, through you know open source uh, availability and you know what they market in their website. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, looking through this coin coin telegraph article, it does have a lot of information about some of the specifics that would help people through. Plus, people can follow you on your Twitter account, which I was sharing earlier, and it'll be linked down below if they want to kind of keep up to date with that. So do you kind of what do you think as far as being uh being awarded the patent and knowing what kind of evidence you're presenting, what your the attorneys you're working with and what you're up against, what do you think the success of this case is going to end up being? Uh, personally, and I'm only calling you speak personally, and personally, I'm not involved in the case. It's uh, a corporate entity. Um, okay. It's a slam dunk. We wouldn't bring a suit if we didn't think we'd win. And I wouldn't even bring it if I didn't think we have a strong chance of winning. Um, from a litigation perspective, I'm over 90% confidence rate. <coughs> with that, with the by 7% of the remaining 10% um, recoverable on appeal if somehow something would go wrong. Um, okay. Do you, what, business, how long? How long do you think something like this can can drag out? It, it all depends what the business uh, sense is of uh, Coinbase's management. It doesn't really make sense to fight this. Um, if they do, um, they have to fight it on multiple fronts. Um, their second largest um, you, Geographic uh, operating base is probably Japan, where we, you know it's quite possible we could bring a suit there as well. Um, and who knows what happens to the future? It's quite possible you could do uh, Greater Asia and Europe. So it's just not worth it, um, right. particularly since um, there's a very very strong chance that they won't win. So um, paying for patents again. With the open source cypherpunk mentality, it's uh, many people are unrealistic. I think in the last show, I don't know, but just in case, I'll do it again. Uh, you do you want a web a website? Mm -hmm. um, do you use like a hosting service like Amazon or? or Unfortunately, you... I had to use a hosting service. Yeah, I don't okay. have server space. Okay, so you pay for this hosting service and you use their product, their mm -hmm. services, and their product. Um, you can dispute whether you should pay for their services or product and not pay them and try and get it for free. And you could go to court and you can fight them in court. Or you could just pay the damn hosting service, right? <laughs> or you can go and invent and build your own servers and invent your own cloud storage and your cloud, you know, uh, load bouncing and run it out of your basement. Or right. you just pay the damn hosting service. I think Coinbase should just pay the uh, license fee. Now, of course, I have a um, uh, biased perspective, but I also have a very, very practical um, management style as well. Okay, two questions. One, do you think they would that Coinbase would be more apt to settle? And then if they settle or if it goes to, I don't know, trial, I'm not sure how it would be if it's a corporate case like that, if it goes to, to, to court, um, in that aspect, would it would would that set a precedence, or is a, does a settlement take a precedence away? Um, well, it, if we settle, it, it depends. If uh, and I'm not a lawyer, so and neither neither am I. And I, I was just curious because I've been learning about law and and how the courts operate, and I'm just I was curious about that one because I know if you were to outright win the case without a settlement, it would give you precedent, and that would help you in further um, issues where you are trying to make sure that you're protecting your IP in other situations. Yeah, it it would is definitely stronger if I win in a jury trial, okay, or you know through a tribunal with a judge, but. We asked for a jury trial. I uh, most um, litigation does not go to trial. At least does not finish 
you know, with a judgment from a jury, um, a, a adjudication, because it's very risky, very expensive, and very time consuming. I think that only happens when both sides are deeply, deeply entrenched in their position. Um, I cannot speak for Coinbase. I know they have to rattle, shake the tree, and you know, rattle the branches to see if they can anything fall down. But you know, that's to be expected. I knew the motion to dismiss was coming. You know, we had the opposition prepared before they even wrote the motion to dismiss, honestly, um, at least mentally. And uh, they're going to push to see um, and test our resolve. Because this is a very, very high stakes um, case for Coinbase. Like I said, from my calculations and our team, and our team is good. These are the guys who helped me predict Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers and Countrywide and Washington Mutual. And you know the European debt debacle. You know we've done a lot. Um, we're not amateurs. This is uh, a one and zero binary life and death for Coinbase. If Coinbase is not allowed to use Ethereum validators and to trade NFTs and to uh, handle uh, stable coins and um, Bitcoin and Litecoin, Solana, then what is their business? Right. But you don't have any plans of excluding them from using the IP. You just want to be compensated for, for their use of it, right? Well, the lawsuit is for compensation, but um, you can never predict the future. Um, and I'm not saying I am going to do it, but do understand how this works. Um, I had my own transactional uh, business, and it was not even effectively. It literally was shut down because I didn't have the put of capital access that Coinbase does. Coinbase does something, the um, SEC sends them a letter and says, don't do it or we'll send you. I do something, they send me a Wells notice. Like a Wells right, notice and it, letter that says we're gonna sue you. I know so, how expensive it was for library who lost their suit. So, I mean, I know that the SEC case definitely was not a positive thing on your financial situation at all. Millions, millions of dollars, millions of dollars. So, um, and the settlement was even worse. That was, you know, the B. But um, if I were to create an exchange, um, well, let's not use me because I don't think I will create an exchange. But if an entity were to create an exchange, you have the right to exclude. If, if JP Morgan had a patent on cryptocurrency exchanges, do you really think that they will license the... Um, that right out to you no everybody else no they would their buddies potentially or just keep it to themselves but yeah they wouldn't be available to just everyone i don't think they license to their buddies i think they keep it to themselves and then they have their buddies as licensed counterparties okay okay See that i don't know enough about that yeah so the, the, and and i'm just again speculating um that's not my business model at least not right now. I don't see it happening, but um, I am a businessman. So I don't think with emotion, I don't say, you know, anti-patent or pro that. I simply do where the ethics and the numbers carry me. Right. I, I am an ethical person. So, Well, since you're doing this lawsuit, I don't know if you have this, if, if, if when you sue a company, if you have this availability to, to see the, their financial inf information, but with, the question about what entities have had, um, whether or not they had exposure to FTX, how much exposure, whether or not there's a a one for one reserve at exchanges, which would include Coinbase. I would think Coinbase would be, after all the years they've been in the industry, that they would be one of the few that we should be able to think would be safe. But do you have any side of any sort of insight into? the books of Coinbase as far as whether or not they are solvent or if they're having any sort of insolvency issues based off of what's going on in the crypto market currently? Well, I have opinion based upon public information and my own experience and knowledge and that of my team. I have a team looking at Coinbase, pretty deep dive, <clears throat> 114 page report um, with two or three uh, updates. Um, if uh, we successfully um, dismiss their motion to dismiss. The next step would be discovery, and I do get into see a lot. But um, I either will not have access or will not use um, 
what I get for anything other than the actual uh, suit itself. So if I get in, you know, valuable inside information on finances, it's not like I'm going to go on YouTube and say, hey, you know, Coinbase did this. So, um, right. Would, but you could, you could say, hey, Rice, uh, I, there, I heard there's a birdie who just told me that maybe you shouldn't have anything on Coinbase. <laughs> well, and I, w- I would not do that with information I get from Discovery. But I get it. I, I, I get it. You can say will, that publicly. I, I will say it publicly for information that's available publicly. Rice, I would not keep anything on Coinbase or any other centralized exchange. I'll even take it a step farther. If you lose any money from having assets on FTX, Coinbase, Gemini, or any centralized exchange, you had it coming because that's not what crypto is for. You don't take something, you rip it off of a chain and then send it to somebody else. Right, you don't you don't give somebody else custody of your crypto when you should yeah. be custodying it yourself. You should have it in possession. You should have the crypto in possession, have it in a wallet that you control and have your private keys all the time. Now, there, it is possible for unless you're you, actively trading or something right, like right. that. Yeah. I mean, there's there's some there's some scenarios that make sense for why you would utilize, but yeah. it, it's like Celsius this. and interest yeah. that that was too good to be true. If you if you have if you lose anything besides assets that are waiting for a standing order, you had it coming. That's a simple, simplified, you know, route plan. If you're waiting for order to be hit and you have a, you know, you know, a stop somewhere or a market order, not market, uh, a limit order. Right. And, you know, the exchange goes down. Okay. You know, that happens, but that should be a de minimis portion of your portfolio. You know, always keep possession of your assets. But you're not saying that because you're thinking that there's issues with these particular entities. You're just saying this is how people should be in general. Both. Okay. I'm saying that's the whole purpose of crypto is self-sovereignty. That's why there's crypto. That's why it was created. So if you want to do business with a shadow bank, then do business with a shadow bank. Coinbase and FTX are shadow banks. They're not even exchanges. Whoever called them an exchange is of the same mindset as saying patents are bad in open source only. You can't have reliable open source products without protecting your IP. Or else you can't keep it open source. Someone takes it, you know, you know, rewrites it and makes it closed source and doesn't give it away. So you have to be able to protect your IP to even have open source. A lot of the early crypto guys didn't understand these nuanced legal and financial aspects of the business and nothing wrong with that because you know not everybody could be a finance guy or a lawyer i'm not a lawyer i have what you would call an experiential law degree that's law degree the hard way (laughs) (laughs) i don't want it 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 is nothing to brag about trust me but unfortunately it is what it is so um what coinbase and ftx are they're broker dealers okay which is very different from an exchange um, I'm not going to say they're securities broker dealers because often, not all the time, but often I disagree with the SEC's perspective on the classification of these assets, <clears throat> but they're broker dealers nonetheless. And so a broker dealer that has a shadow banking arm, um, is in other words, Goldman Sachs, you know, just Goldman Sachs also has a fully chartered and fully licensed banking arm as well. Okay, but you know, they trade, they give loans, they do stuff on collateralized, collateralized swaps, et cetera, et cetera. If you're gonna take the risk of dealing with a bank, deal with a regulated bank with transparency, you know, liquidity med- um, minimums, you know, tier one, tier two, tier three capital minimums, et cetera. It's safer. Okay. Now, if you wanted to do things, you know, on chain from a self sovereign custody perspective, well, then do it which means you stay away from centralized exchanges. These centralized projects are getting better and better every year, okay? And uh, I think I have one of the earliest to the first. I definitely had one of the best at that time before it was taken down, and I'm a big believer in it. Now, I'm not saying nobody should ever do centralized business, but if you do, you need to realize what you're doing and accept the risk. And if you're going to do right. this, you should at least do a centralized business with somebody who uh, has clarity. I'm not anti-regulation. Nothing is going to get big in the U.S. without regulation. And there's a reason for regulation, but it has to be real regulation. 
not what the SEC is doing. SEC is doing club mommery. They're basically being mafioso. Um, that's not regulation. Look at what Singapore has done. Um, look at what Japan is doing. Um, even the Bahamas. You know, practically everybody's doing it better than the U.S. The U.S. is, I don't want to speak too much on it because I don't want these guys coming back after me, but um, this, no, I mean, I'll say it. I mean, I've said it a lot. There's there's a lot of corruption in the SEC, and Gary Gensler looks like he's a dirty motherfucker as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I was talking with you a little bit about the FTX situation, his connections with his his, his former boss, uh, the head of the head of the economics department at MIT, and his connections, uh, his dealings with SBF, and then me knowing a little bit about um, some of the inside information from community members about how the veritasium sec case went and kind of seeing how in my opinion there was some dirty dealings going on there and that wasn't under under gensler either um i'm trying to be cool with what i'm saying but the sec can definitely come after me all they want because uh i don't think that the sec is going to exist too much longer well just be aware what happened to veritasium to me personally what happened? None of that occurred under Gensler. That was under Jay Clayton. Right, so right. A lot of people, especially in like social media and the Twitterverse, they get political and they miss the point. You know, they start partisan ramblings. The left, this, that, Trump, Biden, whoever. Listen, most of the SEC are um, bureaucrats and a lot of the employees survive through multiple um party changes it's it's kind of like what we think about with shadow government where you have different people in positions who are in lifetime positions in a government who aren't in elected positions who gain a lot of favor and control and power so th that's why i'm not i'm not pointing the finger just at gary gensler mm -hmm. i i am saying that the sec I'm not saying whole, I'm, I'm saying, saying I'm saying, saying the SEC is true. corrupt as fuck, and there's a lot of yeah. evidence over the years that point towards that. And they're using antiquated laws, and they're supposed to be protecting the American citizens, but they're not, or the U.S. citizens, whatever you want to call it. But they're not doing that. They're in fact seems like protecting entities like FBX, FTX, FBFXTX. I just get it. It's ABC one, two, three. So uh, it's just, I mean, I know there's certain things that you can't say because of the case, but I can speak freely on my opinion. And I feel based off of what I've learned, it's a very corrupt organization. I would like to see the end of the SEC and I would like to see something new come in place. I agree. I'm not a fan of regulation, but we need it. Uh, especially when we have bad actors in the space like what we have going on now with insolvency with entities. You know, it's like I don't I don't know if when Celsius went uh, bankrupt and insolvent, I don't know if that was Celsius's fault or if it was more on something on the end of FTX because I'm starting to think FTX might have been uh, – behind a lot of the crashes and thing and a lot of the insolvencies that we see in the cryptocurrency space that happened even before it, which would include um, Celsius, un unfortunately. So it's, it's a scary situation for crypto. Um, let, let me jump in and fill my two yeah. cents. You know, number one, we're talking regulation. FTX was a Bahamian company. Okay. So it has nothing to do with us regulation, but let, people are forgetting that. Uh, um, well, no, now, supposedly, supposedly, like different different parts of FTX, I think in other countries, I think they halted trading. But uh, I was watching a live interview from the um, New York Post thing uh, a little bit ago, and I, he, the way that Sam Bankman Free was talking was that that they basically have all the funds in certain countries like Japan and other countries, and that might have something to do with the regulation that you were talking about. I just wanted to add that in there. Yeah, they they do it right. Um, also. Um, what happened to Celsius? The reason why Celsius went bust was the users. You know, again, you put your money, you put a large amount or any meaningful amount of capital into a black box that offers rosy returns. And then Brown stinky stuff comes out the other side. Man. You know, you, you Brown gotta, stinky stuff. I like that. <laughs> you know, just putting these colors together. Um, 
you had no visibility into Celsius's balance sheet, into their liquidity situation, into their liabilities, asset liability mismatch. You have no idea. Ran by a guy who never ran a bank before. I don't think he ran a bank before. Um, no, he was one of the inventors. Alex Mashensi specifically was one of the inventors of voice over internet protocol, which has nothing to do with banking. Actually, I think there's a sister who used to be VP at Google, who currently is a professor, and she holds a patent on voice over IP. Um, well, there was a team. He's not the sole inventor. There was a team. Yeah. He may have been a part of that team of the creator yeah. of voice yeah, over I don't internet. Think, I don't think he's a co-creator. He says he was. But and again, that might be bullshit too. It might be the, bullshit. The paper, the paper says otherwise, but again, it doesn't really matter. Um, I met him once in Miami and tried to talk to him. He brushed me off. But I used I'm to not- think the guy was really cool. Um, he wasn't somebody who, I mean, um, being somebody who has spent some time on the street and being somebody who in the past has bullshitted people, uh, it's really easy for me to spot bullshitters. You know, the saying a bullshitter can spot a bullshitter from a mile away. And I just wasn't feeling that from him. And um, he seemed like he had really good, legitimate intentions. But um, I guess good good fraudsters could be. Yeah, I'm not saying I don't know enough personal information because it could have been more behind the, the situation. I mean, if they were using FTX to do trading and FTX knew what was being done with large amounts of capital It's possible the FTX could have been counter trading it. They could have been taking advantage of the insider information. Who, who knows? But it just got really messy. Yeah, but but see, that's sort of my point. And this is why I'm a believer of regulation for centralized entities that hold customer assets. Um, because not all customers are knowledgeable enough to demand the information that they need. Even though they should be, but they're not. And um, the only way to get that is for the market to force it or for the government to force it. The government forces it through regulation. Imagine what banks would do if they didn't have to do quarterly reports on solvency. Maybe and a cap- lot more criminal than they are legally and, now. You know, and you know, and banks push the limit right now. Okay. Yeah. Imagine if they didn't have to produce these numbers. So I am a believer that if you're going to hold customer assets in a significant um way particularly if it's not fully segregated if you go hold it on balance sheet you know you have to report these numbers if you can segregate it and hold it in individual customer accounts where you don't have control that's a different story okay um the best way to do that would be oh yeah on chain using a dex or decentralized you know device right you but know? on chain on chain you can completely you can you don't have to trust that you can verify it Right. I mean, that, and there's always some trust. For instance, you know, um, what's your favorite Dex? Uh, well, I mean, I I was a big user of um, Uniswap, but now I think that they're collecting information and reporting data, like IP information. I even heard MetaMask was doing something like that. So I have to look into some other Dex situations. <laughs> well, they're all going to have to do it because they're not doing it voluntarily. They're doing it because <laughs> there's a gun to the head. Well, there's going to be some people out there who are going to do it differently, who aren't yeah. going to who aren't going to be found. You know, and I yeah. think you know that's the good part about anonymous projects. Um, there are good dexes out there, and I need to get <laughs> acquainted. But go ahead with your point. Sorry. Well, well, the point is your favorite dex is Uniswap. I am pretty sure you didn't read and audit Uniswap's uh, uh, master contracts and helper contracts, did you? No, but I don't think that there was any there was any requirement to read those to open an account. Right, there's not. But so I wouldn't even I point. wouldn't even I wouldn't have even thought that there would have been data like that. Right. Well, no, and I, I don't mean legal contracts. I mean the small contracts of power units. Well, so if you don't read it and you use it, then you're trusting somebody. Okay. So True. it's open source and it's decentralized, but there's a large amount of trust. Right, that's been given to Uniswap. Okay, and you know most of the projects that come by have significant financial holes. Um, I ran over. I just did a tweet this morning at nine o'clock um, in a, a company video uh, discussing how Coinbase is rehypothecating assets from USDC. Um, I was just working on it, and I'm going to apologize to Coinbase. I was wrong. Okay, 
Oh, um, you were wrong. I, Reggie uh, Middleton's admitting he was wrong. I was wrong. I, I, listen, no, I, 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 know, I know that you're a good dude. I just got to be a little sarcastic yeah. here, man. No, but, I, but see, the major prerequisite, primary prerequisite for me admitting that I'm wrong is me being wrong. Okay. Um, now, here's that's the bad news or the good news. That's the good news for Coinbase, the bad news for me. Here's the bad news for Coinbase, the good news for me. I was wrong. They're not rehypothecating, but they're multiplying the risk of USDC holders significantly. Um, it's arguable which is worse, but it's pretty bad. So I was breaking it down and I'll release it in a tweet probably tomorrow. I don't think I'll do it tonight. Uh, basically, Coinbase is a significant risk. Uh, Moody's has them rated at BA2 and BA3, and they're looking to downgrade them. Um, Downgrading past BA3 is a B1 at the highest. Um, that is, they're going from um, a material credit risk to a significant credit risk or worse. So when you Based off with, what information? Based off all the information uh, that Moody's has access to. Coinbase okay. is a public company, so they have access to a lot. Okay. Um, and I'm going to put all this in my... It's not going to be an apology. It's going to be an admittance of error because I didn't make a mistake. But my mistake was not from a credit perspective. It was more from a mechanical perspective. Um, after going through the S1 filing, I found that they. this is um, the presumption that I made. Circle mints USDC. They sell it to a buyer. Buyer gives Circle $100 million. Circle gives them $100 million USDC. Circle invests that hundred million dollars into investments, short-term loans, presumably high quality. Don't always know, but presumably, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. The three month treasuries, bank accounts, etc. They get interest and come off of this, and they keep it, and that's their business model. That's their revenue model. The people who bought or entities that bought the USDC tokens, they're taking operation risk from Circle, which is also a high risk company with a junk rating or these a junk credit. Um, they're taking the operation and counterparty and credit risk of Circle and the investment risk that Circle is investing in using to create this yield. But the USDC owners are getting paid big fat zero. So you're getting nothing. That is called, um, in veritation parlance, return free risk, where you're taking risk and getting no return for it. Um, now, Coinbase, who is a significant voting member of MakerDAO and other large voting members or investors of Coinbase, the VCs, they're going to MakerDAO and they say, I'm going to suggest that you give us 1.6 billion USDC and we will give you up to 1.5% um, APY on that in the form of reward. And I said, well, the only way to generate that yield is to take risk with it. That's the only way to do it. So I was assuming they were lending it out to their Coinbase Prime customers and Coinbase Prime customers, you know, borrow assets and they pay a yield for it. And that's how Coinbase Prime makes money. One of the uh, revenue streams, just like Celsius and BlockFi and Voyager and everybody else. Okay. And FTX. <coughs> Nothing wrong with that per se, depending on how you do it, <coughs> but you have to good notify the owner of the USDC that you're lending it out. Um, Brian Armstrong said he does not leverage um, client funds uh, without their consent, and he backs everything one-to-one. -one. But um, I said, if you take USDC that's backed by dollars, and then you go and lend that USDC out for yield, you are taking one set of collateral and making two loans with it. That's rehypothecation, hypothecating more than once which means somebody's going to be without collateral. The mistake was that Circle's generating that yield by its partnership with Circle. I said Circle. Coinbase is generating that yield through its partnership with Circle, as I right. said. And they're, getting a, they're taking a portion of the investment income from um, Circle's investment, and they're sharing it with the USDC holders. In exchange for those USDC holders, holding their USDC on Coinbase's platform. So they're not rehypothecating. They're just 
splitting a portion of their revenue in exchange for custody of these assets. Okay, <clears throat> these assets are not held in um, the control possession of USD holders. It's on Coinbase's balance sheet. That's the bad part. That means you have the full credit risk and full counterparty risk of Coinbase, which is a pure, a straight junk rating. Um, a B1 rating, I've been looking it up, has between three and a half and 22% default risk. That's how, wow. let's take the best case scenario at a three and a half percent default risk and chop that in half. You're taking the best case scenario, we're gonna have it, okay? which would be roughly 1.75% uh, default risk. Does that sound like cash to you? That you're sounds crazy. Cash. Instead, there's a, um, the probability is you lose, in a best case scenario, times two, you lose 1.75% for doing business with that particular credit rating. So who in the world would put their USDC that already is not receiving any income, right? With Coinbase to receive up to, not one and a half percent, but up to one and a half percent, and then take uh, probably 3.5 to 22% default risk. Stupidity, pure stupidity from an arithmetic perspective. Yeah, and the thing was too, and I, I had thought, I don't know why I thought this, uh, maybe it was because Coinbase was trying to apply for a banking license, but I thought that they had some sort of FDIC insurance, but they don't. So, um, that I know of. no, and I just I was did. looking it up while I was talking with you. Yeah, even if they did, okay, FDIC insurance covers up to two hundred fifty thousand. Okay, Coinbase is a significant risk. Significant, yeah. and we're not even counting probably the biggest risk they have, which would be what. The biggest risk Coinbase has? Yeah. I don't know if it would be. I mean, I don't think it would be security. Um, I don't know. What's the biggest risk Coinbase would have? Just about their entire business model is predicated on patented IP, of which they're engaged in a patent infringement suit right now. So someone like uh, who owns a patent on DeFi, uh, which would cover most of what they're doing, it's listed in a lawsuit that's currently going on. That could be something that they have to worry about. Suppose that entity decides to exclude them and wins out of business. In this particular instance, Coinbase would be up Shit's Creek without without a paddle. Would be, I guess, the the right that, that paddle. That paddle will be where the substance of that creek comes from. <laughs> uh, you can figure but again, that one out. I mean, you don't. You don't. I, I have to ask. You don't have any intentions as of now to exclude Coinbase. Uh, you're seeking. Compens or not you, the corporate entity is seeking compensation for the IP rights. Well, but I guess if something went sour, you always have the option to exclude anybody you want from utilizing your IP. From a business perspective, you I don't want people it. watching this interview thinking Reggie Middleton is going to take down Coinbase. Okay, well, here, let's go through all the scenarios. From a business perspective, you should never take anything off the table. Um, my business has no reason to exclude Coinbase. You know, it just doesn't. Right. Um, but let's suppose someone does exclude Coinbase. They exclude Coinbase most likely because they plan on taking over with a better product, a better business model. You know, there are many improvements I can make on Coinbase on USDC. Stable coins, asset backed stable coins right now are all in the exact same situation as USDC. It's return free risk. And there's no reason to do that. There's no reason to hold a stable coin. There really isn't, okay? And in order to generate a yield on a stable coin, you have to rehypothecate. Or you could do a stable, what a uh, stable Coinbase is doing if you have a relationship with the uh, issuer and you can share your portion. Coinbase is a reseller of USDC. You could share your portion of the uh, investment yield. But if you do that, then you have to keep your USDC on a junk um, credit risk, which is foolish. The whole purpose of having USDC is safety and a lack of volatility. And you inject a lack of safety and increased volatility just by giving it to Coinbase. Or you any centralized uh, custodial service or central or centralized exchange. Yeah, I mean, there are some centralized custodial services that have higher credit ratings, 
but I can't think of any that are in the crypto space. I was going to say crypto, though. Crypto. That's yeah, the, good, and, good. I mean, like, I would have well, thought that Coinbase would have been the one. It, it, I mean, it makes sense with their longevity and in the, in the industry and such. So, If you think so, well, here. I'm saying I, think, I would think so, but based off the information you're sharing with me, it doesn't sound – I don't sound as confident in saying that now. Well, don't take my word for it. Um, Google Coinbase is uh, – like go to like Google Finance or Yahoo Finance or CNBC and pull up a chart of Coinbase's share price performance since I IPO. Mm -mm. IPO. And then after you do that, you're gonna pull up uh, two more charts. Well, I was just searching for this for to find an article, so let me go ahead and get this pulled up and do the screen share with this. Okay, uh, let me see here. And so what we're doing is we're, sh we're looking at the equity market's uh, perception of Coinbase's prospects um, relative to their perception um, at IPO. I was looking for a chart, and this Forbes article just has a bunch of verbiage. Hold on a yeah, second. Go, 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 go to, just go to Google Finance or Yahoo Finance or CNBC and just type in coin. Um, and just pull up the Google shop. Finance. Or well, CNBC, just you know, any finance site. I've got coin pulled up and let me get the screen share. Hold on one moment. Okay. Okay. Go to five year or year to date. Uh, I'm one year or five year. Do one or five. Which one? Five. They're only a year old, but okay. So you see that? That's what the market thinks of Coinbase's prospects. From 300 and what? About 340? 340, almost 343. Yeah, in about a year and change. So that's what the equity markets think of Coinbase's uh, health. Yeah, but on this, on the same, on this, on just to be fair, all markets are down. Crypto's oh. down. I mean, okay. everything's we're in a we're in a we're in a bear market. We're in what you would call a bust cycle, right? Well, let's let's prove that. Um, add to that the S and P five hundred or Nasdaq. Just add, just just go to the search no, bar. No, and add that. You should go to the chart. You should be able to add um, another. Let's see here. I don't know where you to do be that. Add it somewhere. That's what I'm looking for. I don't see where to add it. I've never done that before to okay, compare well, charts. Yeah, if you have good. Well, if you if you don't see it, you can take my word for it. Um, or you don't have to take my word for it. What is that? A roughly an eighty nine percent drop has the general crypto market and uh, the general equity markets dropped eighty nine percent. On average, uh, not as much. No, I would say more like sixty seventy percent. If I'm thinking off the top of my head. Nah. It, uh, well, just, Bitcoin is sixty nine, and now sitting at seven, it's right between sixteen and seventeen. Okay, well that's Bitcoin. Okay, but you're not looking at a crypto. You're looking at a uh, stock. So, do type in uh, S and P five hundred. S and P five hundred index. There you go. The first one there. And do uh, one year because it'd be fair. Coinbase. They're not five years old. Do one year. Okay. How much is that drop total now? Uh, nine and a half percent. Nine point six percent. Okay, so we're talking roughly ten times. Coinbase is doing 10 times worse than the equity markets. Okay. Yeah. That's a big okay. difference. Now, um, look at Coinbase's bonds. And the bond market is show that Coinbase's bonds have been chopped in half, roughly. They yield in between 13 and 18%. Deep, deep, deep into junk. Treasury bonds are doing about 3 to 5%. Deep, deep into junk. That's what the credit markets think of Coinbase's prospects. Okay, and then if you do a uh, do a Google search on uh, Moody's Coinbase rating, you can see what Moody's thinks of them. And I just told you we started this conversation off. Moody's has it rated that the corporate um, debt is BA three, and their senior secured is BA one, and they're both under review for a downgrade to go deeper in a jump, higher higher risk, higher speculative uh, rating. So no matter which way you look at it, the private rating companies have a negative and they're always behind the curve.
you know, I have yet to see Moody's or, or S&P or Fit, um, Fisk predict a bankruptcy. They always tell you after the company goes bankrupt. Um, but the private rating agencies with the lag um, are negative. The bond market is negative and the equity market is negative. And you're going to go and you're going to take your USDC, which you have only because you don't want to take risk, and you're going to give it to that company? Absolute nonsense. Is this the right page that I want to look at? Like, go here to the scorecard? Um, what's the latest? Uh, I guess. December, December 1st, 2022 compilations, credit outlook. Which uh, is that's a, that's a credit outlook. Because- yeah, you got that. That's the outlook. So that's not historical. That's in projecting to the future. But they're, you know, saying the same thing everybody else is. FTX bus makes things risky. Coinbase is trading revenue goes down. Blah blah. I blah, can't blah. get the scorecard. It's locked unless I have an account. You could just do a regular Google search. You should be able to get it free. Okay. Um, Moody. Moody. It's just a coin, Coinbase bond credit rating. Let's see what this pulls up. Ah, uh, gotta scroll be logged right now. Just scroll all the way down on the uh, no, on the uh, other one. Anyway, no, you had it. Just go back Shit. to where you were. I had to go back to it. Sorry. So, on the second one right here, yeah. Okay, now you see the disclaimer they want you to read? Oh, I got to scroll. Okay, so I can, okay, now I see it. Okay. Okay. So what does that say? It says New York, um, November 21st, Moody's Investor Services. Moody's has placed on review for downgrade Coinbase Global Incorporated, BA3 Corporate Family Rating, CFR, and BA2 Guaranteed Senior Unsecured Notes Rating. The rating action follows heightened and market turbulence in the crypto sector. Which, I mean, in that sense, if they're if they're saying it's based off the fact that the crypto market is turbulent, that makes sense because we're not sure about who has exposure to what. But if it's based off of having information on what's listed on balance sheets and financials, then that's a little bit more, a little bit more alarming. Well, it's both. Okay, they, so it's a combination of the two, right? That, you know, if you're going to do a good job at analyzing so it's it, sentiment, it, sentiment it. and real data. Okay. Well, that's not sentiment. That's volatility, contagion, counterparty risk, credit risk, et cetera. That's not sentiment. Um, th- now, they give a positive uh, rating to Coinbase's liquidity position because they're holding $6 billion as of last reporting. But I'm pretty sure that's going to look at $4 billion when they report again. Um, and they've cut a lot of expenses and costs. But when you cut expenses and costs, you also cut your growth potential. <coughs> Coinbase has a problem. Their business model is broken. Okay. They only make money when Bitcoin goes up and they lose money when Bitcoin goes down. So you're better off just buying Bitcoin. Okay. Um, Coinbase went down more than Bitcoin did. And the stock will probably go up less than Bitcoin does. Um, and Bitcoin doesn't have this nasty uh, patent infringement issue. <laughs> that's a good way of ending an interview um what i do want to do reggie if you're good with it in the next few weeks um before before the holidays really kick off i'd like to get you back on and talk with you about your dow research and kind of dig a little bit more into some of the ip stuff but um for this interview do you have any final thoughts or anything that you want to add before we wrap up today um i want to get the word out i made it i erred on Coinbase and every hypothecation, I was 100%. Actually, I was um, very conservative um, on the actual credit risk, but I was off on the uh, the actual structure of the risk. So I'm going to correct that in my social media tomorrow, too late tonight. Um, and if everybody looked at things the way I did, and I understand it's very difficult. You know, honestly, probably 99.8% or 99.9% of the community cannot do that. You know, I've been doing this for decades and I have a whole team, but um, there's a common sense perspective. Uh, the next time any entity offers, you know, you, you know, 15 golden Jaguars, um, if you give them, you know, 30 of your Bitcoin, 
for one year. Think about it. And then you ask them how they're going to do it. I'm like, well, we're just going to do it. And they say, okay, let me see your books. No, we can't do that. We're a private company. You know, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it ain't a platypus, dude. <laughs> right. No, it's a duck. No. Yeah. Quack, quack. <laughs> True enough. Well, I appreciate you being honest with that. And, you know, we are recording this on the 30th of November. I'm going to release it on the 1st. So the same day that you put out your uh, your edited response to the Coinbase information. But I, I do appreciate your time, man, and I appreciate you explaining things. And definitely looking forward to kind of staying up to date with what's happening with this case and any other future cases and all things in the world of Reggie Middleton. So if you could bear with you one second, just going to do a quick wrap up. I do appreciate you guys for tuning in. I'm going to have links for everything that we talked about on today's show so you can check these out. I do encourage you to make sure you're checking out that second interview that I did with Reggie uh, earlier this year. It'll definitely fill in a lot more blanks about the IP, about the patents that he got in the United States and Japan. If you're not already subscribed to Rice TVX, what are you waiting for? I also encourage you to make sure you subscribe to my new channel, Rice Against the Grain. And I will leave you with this. I encourage you to be a blessing to others. Treat people how you want to be treated. Be the glitch you want to see in the matrix. Be the change you want to see in the world. And until next time, practice change.